you. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you where you are. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Ana Lucia Jacome, Senior Project Leader and Human Rights Expert. I work on the aging and older persons uh, issues at the Division for People and Social Inclusion at the UN Institute for Training and Research, UNITA. I remain at your disposal in case you want to learn more about our initiatives and explore possible synergies. Now, it is my pleasure to give the floor to our moderator, Mr. Alex Mejia, the director of the Division for People and Social Inclusion. Please, Alex. Thank you, Ana Lucia. It's a great honor to be with all of you, uh, to our distinguished panelists, uh, our sincere appreciation for taking the time out of your busy agendas to accept this invitation. We highly respect uh, uh, your level of expertise, uh, your track record, and I'm sure that your contributions um, are going to help uh, to help us at UNITAR definitely, but also to benefit our participants. And to you, dear participant, um, uh, connecting from very many places, I've seen an impressive list. Uh, some of you are still uh, connecting. I simply wanted to thank you on behalf of UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, where I have the privilege of being a, a division director. Now, aging is very important for all of us in this particular uh, website, um, excuse me, webinar. Uh, and I was going to invite you to our website uh, to read more, read more about it. It's, uh, um, it has great momentum. I think we can indeed all uh, relate to how much uh, we have been uh, um, advancing in this demographic change that we are going to discuss today among other topics. So the reality that we see everywhere, uh, we used to have regions in which what I'm going to describe was more exacerbated than others. It's a global phenomenon and a good one, I think, that um, aging populations, that, that we are living longer and that aging populations are more and more visible in society and that they remain active and uh, healthy and uh, with longer years. Um, this is something that we greatly celebrate and embrace. There is no gloom and doom here, <laughs> as some naysayers could say, oh, we are all facing this tremendous crisis because of the, the, the shifting of the pyramid of populations and the actuarial problems and so on. On the contrary, it's a great, great thing that we are witnesses in our day and age. So with that spirit of positivism and optimism, uh, but at the same time knowing that there is a lot to do at the United Nations and beyond to integrate properly uh, all the persons, uh, aging populations, to help them remain active, to learn from their wisdom, um, is very specifically to change public policy and to change the attitudes of governments everywhere to actually understand the value of having all the persons uh, uh, very active uh, throughout all age. So with that spirit, I uh, welcome you to this um, uh, virtual roundtable seri series. This is our second annual uh, edition. Uh, the roundtable series uh, proper is uh, entitled Mainstreaming Knowledge on Aging. And that's exactly what we want to do uh, at UNITAR. These United Nations agencies, and I will say uh, perhaps the United Nations system as a whole, is committed in doing its part so uh, what I just described happened. So we actually have a virtuous uh, situation in which all the persons are guaranteed their access, their inclusion, their rights and the like. So uh, particularly today in mainstreaming knowledge on aging, we will be focusing on the second event of the second annual series uh, is focusing on labor markets. The title of this uh, webinar, as you already know, is access to labor markets for all the persons. And it's the second out of five events. So at the same time that I welcome you all and that I tell you that we are very happy to have these conversations, uh, allow me for the commercial. I invite you to come and join us also for number three and for number four and number five. I guarantee you, you won't be bored. We are lying in an impressive array of speakers and we continue to learn from them. So uh, with this short introduction, let me also tell you um, why we have chosen this topic. Um, basically, the answer is rather simple because uh, uh, learning about the benefits uh, coming from access to labor markets for all the persons paves the way towards inclusive society where this group can indeed continue to participate in public life, uh, to contribute to the generation of wealth 
to contribute to socioeconomic benefits for themselves and for the rest. And uh, so there are very many benefits at the individual level, at the community level, at the society level, but we need to understand better how that access to market actually happened. So uh, in maintaining um, access of all the persons to actual jobs, we uh, ensure that their welfare, their well-being, their psychological sense of self-worth, the dignity and the fulfillment that should come with that uh, persevere. So um, I am um, telling you all of these things because this is a rally, I hope, uh, and a message of invitation for all of you listening to join us in understanding better this topic. Um, if you are like me, I, I'm a former uh, policymaker and a former diplomat. I come from Ecuador in Latin America. I've been a member of the cabinet, if I may say, in a less than humble manner, but I say that for a reason. I really didn't understand this part of what public policy implies. It is after my time in government that I came to understand it and today I'm a great believer. Uh, so if you come from a government, if you come from the public sector and you are listening today, this is an invitation to join us, not only today, but as I mentioned at the beginning in all the series of the upcoming events or to go to our website or many of the websites of the speakers that are uh, going to take the floor. There is a wealth of information that we all need to understand in order to guarantee this uh, um, access to market and several other things that will be ruminating here. So with that, I would like to, uh, and just as, as a point of order, um, I understand that uh, Madame Mallard will be included later, uh, Ana Lucia, not yet. Am I correct? Yes, we are trying our best. Yes, indeed, indeed. And, uh, uh, Madame Claudia Mahler, who is the UN independent expert on the enjoyment for, of all human rights by all the persons, uh, seems to be having uh, some um, uh, connectivity issues, but uh, we wish her well and we hope that she can join us and we, of course, will offer her the floor when the moment comes. So let me stop there and let me ask uh, my colleague, uh, Ana Lucia uh, Hakome, who is an expert on human rights and also a senior uh, project uh, uh, coordinator at UNITAR um, uh, after being a, a very um, successful and distinguished uh, diplomat uh, here in Geneva, working with the Human Rights Council and several other things. Allow me to ask uh, my colleague Ana Lucia to take the floor now so she can actually introduce uh, each one of the uh, panelists uh, when their turn comes. And at the end, I will take the floor again to actually go to the discussion that will ensue. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, Ana Lucia, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear Alex. Let me warmly welcome Madame Dorothea Schmidt-Cloud, uh, Chief of the Employment, Labor Markets and Job Branch of the Department of Employment Policy, Job Creation and Livelihoods at the International Labor Organization. As UNITAR, we celebrate that ILO has joined uh, the series this year for today's topic, indeed, uh, you perfectly fit. In her function, she supports the work of the department to promote full and productive employment by developing integrated employment policies. Her technical areas of expertise include poverty reduction, youth uh, employment, aging societies, employment policies, labor markets, uh, market transitions, labor market information systems, and labor market indicators. Uh, Madame Schmidt uh, has published numerous working papers and articles in her areas of expertise and has worked on major ILO publications, including several world employment reports, uh, global employment uh, trends reports, and most recently, the ILO's monitors on the world of work. Please, uh, Madame Schmidt, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and a big, big thank you for from the ILO side for actually organizing this event. Uh, I wasn't aware of the first cycle and I'm all the more happy uh, to be part of this second cycle. And I will certainly be one of the people uh, following this very closely because what we are talking here about is very much at the heart um, of what we are discussing at the ILO. But at the same time, we need uh, allies to actually strengthen our interest in the topic and make it more popular through partnerships 
and through working together. When I give this type of presentation, um, I know this audience doesn't need a wake up call, but still I think it is good to remind us of, of, um, of some um, stunning facts about aging. Um, just to, to give us a sense of the importance and the urgency of what we talk about. So just remember, a person born today in Europe has a 50% chance to become 100 years old, and women even have a higher chance. Longevity has doubled since 1900, which is the fastest change ever. I'm going to come to the German example in a second. The old age population will grow by over 300% over the course of this century alone, by comparison to the working age population that will only grow by 50%. Developing countries will age most rapidly, and this is very important. Less developed countries will see their older population rise by nearly 350% compared to 70% in developed countries. Of course, they are already quite old, which is why, why the aging is a bit slower. Population aging is happening more quickly than ever. In France, for example, it took 150 years to move from a share of older people of 10% to 20%, 150 years. For Brazil, China, and India, it takes less than 20 years. And I give you the, the German example I was mentioning above. When pensions were introduced in Germany in 1889, life expectancy was 40 years, meaning that almost nobody ever reached pension age. Now, the average age is 80 or even above 80, indicating that the far majority of people will ask for their pensions and do so for a very long period. Let's just have a quick look at this graph um, and particularly at the dark blue parts of the graph. So the bars actually indicate the, um, the, the, the total numbers and the, the dots indicate the shares. And this is the composition of the labor force and the share of older workers by um, sex and actually age, it should say, sorry. Um, but what is important here is that no matter whether developing, emerging, or developed economies, the rising pop aging population is reflected, reflected in rising numbers of older people in the workforce and in rising labor force participation rates of older people and thereby in rising shares of older workers within the workforce. In all regions, no exception whatsoever, and for men and women alike. Now, this has huge economic consequences and huge consequences for labor markets. And I'm going to talk briefly about four of these con consequences. The first one is the complete change in labor supply. The second one is the change in dependency ratios. The third one, the change in consumption patterns, and the fourth one, the changes in transition. Now, you don't clearly see <laughs> what uh, these three graphs show, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what I want to show here is, first of all, that actually the labor force participation rates of the age group 15 to 24, so the young people, are roughly in the same rate as the labor force participation rates of the 55 to 64, whereas the labor force participation rate of the core age group is much higher, going up to almost 90% in some countries. These countries are randomly selected. Um, what I, the second, so labor force partici participation rates differ regarding age groups. But then also, and let's just look at the blue box, which is labor force participation rates of the age group 55 to 64, um, labor force participation rates can change over time. And if we look deeply into what are the reasons behind these changes, there is, of course, for this age group, the simple, you know, mathematical uh, uh, thing to do, which is increase retirement age. If you increase retirement age, then of course the labor force participation rate will automatically go up. But that's just one driver behind this. The rest is really different policies. And we see the range of labor force participation rates, for example, for this age, age group, it varies.
varies a lot. And you see countries like, for example, Germany, who had a labor force participation rates in the 2000s of roughly 40% for this age group, now has a labor force participation rate of above 70%. So policies matter and they make a difference. And this is really important to keep in mind. The second uh, impact that I was mentioning is the change in old age dependency ratios or in dependency ratios in general. And this is just very important. Again, with very few exceptions and the exceptions are only temporary, the old age dependency ratios are changing dramatically. Uh, in all regions, and this is a regional perspective. They are changing most dramatically right now in Northern and Southern and Western Europe, which is the top line. Um, and if we just take this as an example, in the 1990s, per 100 people at working age, there were roughly 31 uh, people at old age, not working anymore. Now this ratio is for 100 people at working age, we have 55 people um, who are not working anymore. And you can clearly see the impact of this uh, uh, on pension systems, um, on the labor market compos composition. Um, but most importantly, you can see the impact this has on the next generation. If this trend continues, just imagine what the young generation needs to pay to cater for the needs of all these people who are actually in, in retirement already. So this is a very important development. Dependency ratios are not the best measure, but still it does show up and tell us something. Now, the change in consumption, this funny graph you see on the right actually comes, comes from the World Economic Forum and they try to actually get a graph on what impacts future consumption. And you see, there are so many things. Okay, there are policies, and then there are there's even things like trust and transparency. There's well-being, and then there is you know impacts, climate change impacts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's super difficult to actually say um, what is going to happen to consumption as a result of aging society. But one thing is we the one thing we know for sure, and that's that the demand for long-term care is going to increase tremendously because people live longer. Luckily, they live healthier, but still because of this long time effect, uh, this is a huge issue. Now, we know that 90% of long-time care workers are women in the majority of the 20 countries and in other countries it's just slightly below. Um, so this has a huge, huge Im implication um, on the possibility to create jobs for women, okay? And if we know this, this is one of the biggest job creator in the, in the future. We also need to take this into account when looking for job opportunities for older workers. Traditionally, older workers are not working in long-term care, but there is a huge potential to actually find jobs for them. The potential is actually 13.6 million jobs globally because that's the shortage we estimate in terms of long-term care workers. The fourth point that I mentioned is actually the changes in transitions. Now, for whatever reason, we know very little about um, transitions um, and this group, the old, older age uh, workers, I don't know, people have not been interested or I don't know why, but we know even less when it comes to transitions. There is a lack of data, there is a lack of, of interest. But one thing we know is that the transition to retirement becomes more and more difficult. And if, for example, we look at, at, at some of the, the European countries that are uh, shown here, um, it is clear that more and more people actually transition from work into poverty, okay? And that's a very big issue. And women throughout all the countries named here, well, almost throughout all countries, as a few exceptions, have a higher risk of ending in poverty when they retire than men. Now, regarding transitions into inactivity, so not retiring yet, but becoming inactive, unemployment, back into labor markets, 
we don't know a lot because very often the data does not come disaggregated for this age group. And this is very difficult. It's also very difficult because we, we know very little because normally what, what statistical offices calculate is up to the official retirement age. But then we do know that people do work after that. We just don't know what and how and what they do. So this is a big issue. We know very, very little even about these standard labor market indicators. And then one thing that is very important, and there we know even less, um, is the transitions are determined, how transitions are determined over the life course. And what we mean here is whether you end up in poverty is actually not decided by the transition from your last job to retirement. It's decided by your first job entry into the labor market. If this first one goes right, then you have a big chance to actually not end up in poverty. And this is very important. We cannot have policies only focusing on this last transition. We need policies to focus on the entire life cycle. When people transition, and that's another thing we know, um, when they, when they ha have transitions and they slowly transit from being full-time employed into retirement, one thing we see is that many of them actually want part-time work. Okay, and this is a wish that more women than actually men have. And you see this in the left part of the graph, the light green bars. So this is actually called not underemployed part-time workers, which means these are workers who want to work part-time. And you see this share has been increasing mm -hmm. until 2019 when this uh, graph finishes tremendously. And it's much higher for women than it is for men. Now, this has two implications for women. The first thing is, if you're looking for a part-time job, your chances to actually find employment is much less. So because women uh, are looking for these flex flexible arrangements, uh, they are less likely to actually find a job. And then if they find a job, it has a negative impact on their pension because they are only working part-time, which has a ne negative impact on what they receive afterwards. So there is a gender component here and we have to be very, very careful because um, women get, they have more difficulties throughout their work life, but these difficulties do not stop when they can become older, they actually increase. And it's all linked to the fact that they are doing more of the care work when they are young for their children, when they are old for their parents. So this is actually reflected in these numbers and we need to be very careful. And this is exactly what, what the result is because of this, but also because of many other reasons, the, the gender gap in pensions in OECD countries, but across the world is tremendous. Uh, we have countries like Japan, where actually what women get as pension is just 50% of what men get. And of course, it's not that dramatic in all countries, but in all of these OECD countries, it's at least, um, well, I think uh, Estonia has the smallest, um, but on average, it's, it's uh, between 20 and 30%, which is enormous. And keep in mind, most women live longer, which means they live longer in poverty. Um, so if we ask for policy entry points, as I said in one of the slides, the inc we, we, have, we can have an impact on labor supply. Okay, that's a very important point. And how we can have impact is one thing is the retirement age, but then another thing is, do we actually need a mandatory retirement age? Or could we just say, you know, people can work as long as they want to and as long as they can, okay? Do we need this means which in earlier years protected workers, but is it still adequate for today? We can also increase the labor force by making workplaces more active and active in terms of aging, which means we need to adjust to the specific needs of older people. Flexible work time arrangements, telework arrangements, but also issues like uh, occupational safety and health and all these issues need to be taken into account so that people who work actually stay healthy, motivated, and really have a workplace that is correct for their own uh, needs. 
And then a big issue is that, especially in the workplace, ageism is very, very widespread. If you talk to, the, to young people, if you keep it general and you say, say, you know, what do you think about older people? Most will say, well, I have no issue. They are say, the same, they are great. But if you ask young people about older people at the workplace, you get very negative answers. And we just need to make sure that if we apply policies, they will only work if we overcome this ageism, and it's not just young people, it's even old people amongst themselves. We need to overcome this perception that older workers are not as good as younger. And this has to do, for example, with this notion they, they their increase in productivity becomes less, which is true. That is what research shows. But at the same time, it shows that they profit more from experience. So it's not that, you know, in total, their progress is less. It's just in terms of productivity increases. And that only happens at a very light point. The other thing that, um, that people say is that older people don't um, learn as easily as young people. And there, the research clearly shows um, only if in between they interrupt learning. So if you have learned languages throughout your life, it's just as easy to do it at the age of 60 as it was at the age of 20. But if you stop at 20 and then you try to learn another language at 60, then it's almost impossible. So this is leading to the, the last point that I have here. You need life course approaches. You need to see the whole development and you need to see what happens to people who interrupt developments, whether it's personal developments, whether it's career developments whatsoever. And we need to make sure that we don't lose them on their way to become a healthy and productive older worker. So the poli policy recommendations are, don't expect that any general employment policy will automatically trickle down to older workers. It doesn't. They are a vulnerable group when it comes to labor markets. And sorry, and if, if you do something for them, you need to do something at the supply side at the demand side and at the matching side. And this is to say, public employment services need to have special services for older workers. Their needs are different. You have to, to really make sure that the older workers actually have the same skills and the same motivation. But even if they have the same skills and the same motivation, if there are no jobs for them, it doesn't help. So you really have to have a comprehensive approach, creating jobs for older people, equipping them so that they can actually take the jobs and having an institution that matches the two. <clears throat> and of course, we need to make sure that, you know, women and men have equal opportunities. We need to have targeted policies um, and accept that work lives are not as, as before. It's not from school to job to retirement. There are many versions of that in between, and this needs to be taken into account. I've spoken about lifelong learning, which is essential. And we need to strengthen social protection and income security, include, including pension credits for care workers, because otherwise we are going to lose women. They will just uh, retire into poverty. Um, we need to policies to support new working pa pa patterns and active aging, which is all about occupational safety and health, etc. And we need to fight against ageism, as I just explained. And the policies need to keep in mind um, that there are other mega drivers. Policy aging societies or demographic shifts are one of them, but we need to see how this is linked to the other three, which is digitalization, decarbonization, and globalization. So um, we cannot look at this in isolation when we want to formulate good policies. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Schmidt, uh, for your interesting presentation. It's quite, uh, it's quite informative, and we will try our best uh, to gather all the main ideas in the takeaways uh, document. We will also be including uh, some links that could be a complement for your explanation. Now, I have the honor to welcome Madame uh, Claudia Mala. Uh, UN independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons. He has been the independent expert um, elected by the UN Human Rights Council since uh, May 2020. 
She has been a senior researcher in the field of economic, social, and cultural rights at the German Institute for Human Rights since 2010. Over the last uh, 20 years, she has also worked as a lecturer in the field of human rights law in different academic institutions in Germany and Austria. Dr. Mahler, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, and I hope you hear me quite well. I'm really sorry for coming late, but uh, after so many Zoom um, events, I don't know what the problem was, but I'm glad to be here today. Thank you so much, and thank you for the warm welcome to the second round of this series. I think this is already an applause uh, to UNITAR for also highlighting the older person's human rights issues as well in all the different settings. As uh, Ana Lucia already mentioned, I'm the current independent mandate holder on the human rights of older persons, and I'm the second one. So it's a very new and um, mandate. And as she already pointed out, I was uh, I started this career in the COVID crisis, and as you understand, I really missed to meet people in this time in the countries because we were not allowed to travel. But in principle, I mandated to two country missions per year and to two thematic reports. This year, I will present the report on abuse of older persons and on the climate change related disasters and the impact on the human rights of older persons. And I had the honor to visit three countries. One was Nigeria, the Dominican Republic, and also Bangladesh. And my first country mission brought me to Finland. And you can imagine that I had very different approaches and different exchanges there. Um, I will not speak much about the numbers. My colleague from ILO already mentioned a couple of numbers about older persons, and I'm sure our colleague from UNFPA, Michael, will also mention more. But I wanted to let you know that we are reaching a decade where there will be more older persons than children under five for the first time. And this is also something where I think we can also start working on the access to the labor market as well, because as our colleague already pointed out quite clearly, there are less younger persons, lesser younger workers than older workers, and we need to make it possible that they have access to the labor market and they, they have the same opportunities to work there. As you all know, older persons are entitled to the right to work and to the access to the labor market, but they do have many barriers and many of them were already mentioned. One is ageism and age discrimination. And as we know, the current human rights framework does not tackle these issues in the right way we are still missing a prohibition on age discrimination, even though the labor laws are the ones who are most elaborated on age discrimination, but ageism, negative stereotypes, which were also quite um, rightly pointed out how they look like for all the workers are present in the labor market, also in the policies and in the policy makers and also in the law. So these are structural barriers which hinder them to access the labor market. And I think this is also quite important. And as I said before, I had the chance to speak with people in four different countries. And for me, it was really interesting to hear that it was not only access to the healthcare system or access to social security. It was mostly mentioned that they miss good access to the labor market because it's not only the earning money for the living, for their lived realities, it's also to be part and participate in the community and participate in society because labor and the labor market has huge social aspects. And many of them told me, you know, we don't have access to the labor market. We always hear we are a burden for society, but we want to do our share but give us the access and we will do our share as good as we can. So I fully see that this is 
that this must be taken into account much more by the policymakers and the lawmakers and also include this with support to have access to the labor market. I think we also all know that mixed workforces are a very good team. So if we can manage to reduce ageism and also support the interrelatedness with young and older workers in the labor market, this would be a success for all of us. And as I'm coming from the human rights perspective, I would also like to share with you that many of the older persons who I had the chance to talk to also told me because they are migrants or because they come from a LGBTIQ background or they are indigenous, it's even harder for them to stay in the labor market or get hired. And I would also support and echo what we just heard that it's the first entry to the labor market which has the impact on the older person's life in the labor market. It is a life cycle approach we need to take into account because otherwise they don't have the same chances as others and they don't have the chance to fully enjoy their human rights. We know that the Universal Declaration on on human rights is has recognized the right on access to the labor market in article 23 and where they also do have their non-discrimination clause we also know that the international convention on economic social and cultural rights guarantees the right to work for individuals in article 6 and as well as in other conventions like CEDAW specifically for women or the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but age is not really taken into account. And also the ILO, even though there are a couple of very good documents, I think we also just heard that we are not there already. We don't know the data. We don't know, uh, we don't have inclusive policies and actions. So this also is from my perspective where we see quite clearly that we need a human rights convention which tackles this issue from a very broad perspective, including the intersections approach, intersectional approach, and also recognizing all these intersectional challenges for all the persons in their full diversity, taking into account gender, disability, migrant background, indigenous background, and all the difficulties they are facing because the challenges of these stereotypes are really embedded in our society. And this also comes to light when we are discussing digitalization, for example. We, I'm sure we will hear more about this from our colleague at the panel, but I also realize that very often it's very negatively approached that older persons don't have the means to to work in a digital world, which is not true. If they get enough support, if they have long life learning experiences, they are more than capable. But it's more like a question of trust and it's more like a question of negative stereotypes. But in this regard, we also need to take into account that many older women do have difficulties because they never had the chance in their earlier days to get access to digital tools and this is why it's even harder for them to have the lifelong learning approach and get into the or dive deep into the ITU different issues we will discuss a little bit later. But I think we also need to take these different aspects into account in our discussion. And from my perspective, Governments really need to prepare themselves to get active and to include all the persons in their market ideas, in their labor market, and have specific measures to bring them back or bring them into the market. Otherwise, they are losing a lot proportion of very good workers for the labor market. And this case, I would say what we also need is to change our policies, 
the market also needs to take into account the positive contribution and the participation and the willingness of older workers to stay longer. So therefore, I was also very happy that the retirement age was already mentioned. If you ask people, older workers, many of them say, it would be nice to decide for ourselves. And we also have had already some examples, like in the UK, where the retirement age is not strict, it's more flexible, and they already have some good experience as well, even though they have other problems. But I also would like to stress that from the UN perspective, we also need to include more older persons and their support and their dignified life into our discussions. It cannot be real that the UN very often stop also at the age of 60 and does not include older persons in the discussion when, when we have all these, you know, crises on the ground right now, where we also need to include older persons, their knowledge, their wisdom and their productivity. Last thing I wanted to mention, this is really a call for all stakeholders to value and harness the potential of older persons and ensure more equality and a better future for, for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Madam Muller. As we mentioned at the very beginning, it's an honor to have you here with us. Uh, your message is quite important. We all need a legally bonding instrument to strengthen the, the measures uh, to duly protect and promote the human rights of older persons. Now, to continue, it's a pleasure to introduce Madame Roxana Biltmer Iliescu, Senior Coordinator on Digital Inclusion at ITU. She's the focal point for older persons and for ICT digital accessibility. She advises ITU members and stakeholders on establishing policies and executing strategies to meet all people's needs in using information and communication technologies, especially for older persons in vulnerable situations, ensuring that everyone is included in the digital society and ecosystem. Uh, congratulations for all the initiatives you have been focused on. Please, dear colleague, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ana Lucia. I don't know if uh, you may wish to, to run a very short video that highlights uh, some of the ITU activities with regard all the person at the beginning or at the end. It's just to, to ensure that uh, my um, speech will be coordinated with regard this uh, uh, this presentation. Yes, no problem. If you want, uh, we can run it uh, right now. The world is digital and its population is aging. For the first time in human evolution, people aged over 60 have outnumbered children under five years old and are predicted to reach 2 billion by 2050. Older persons have always been an asset to their families, communities and societies. Nevertheless, they are being perceived as a vulnerable group, dependent on younger generations. The digital world can, no doubt, enable older persons to participate and contribute to society, turning this misconception of vulnerable into valuable. In an interconnected world, information and communication technologies, or ICTs, can empower and contribute to healthy, independent and fulfilled lives of present and future older adults. ICTs, if provided in accessible and user-friendly formats and platforms, can be valuable enablers for older adults, helping them to overcome more easily age-related limitations, including hearing, dexterity and visual impairment. For example, accessible smart televisions allowing users with hearing aids to enjoy all types of entertainment content with their families. Use of virtual assistant technology to obtain all types of information and access online services. Use of zooming features to increase the font size 
to facilitate reading. The digital context reduces distances and avoids isolation and loneliness. It also facilitates active participation in all aspects of today's society. Therefore, by building accessible and inclusive digital environments, all users can adapt technology to their specific abilities and needs. For instance, they can buy products more easily using the e-commerce process, manage their finances and payments through e-banking, continue lifelong learning thanks to opportunities offered by e-learning platforms, contribute to society, including sharing their experiences and enhancing constructive dialogue between generations. Moreover, in 2020, the Global Coalition on Aging estimated the global market value of older adults, the so-called silver economy, at 17 trillion US dollars and growing. There is a huge business opportunity for this untapped market. To help member states create accessible and age-friendly ICT environments, the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, has developed the report, Aging in a Digital World, From Vulnerable to Valuable. The report not only raises awareness of the trends and good practices, but also provides concrete guidelines to ensure healthy, happy and valuable aging and empower older persons as active participants in their digital communities and societies. For more information on ITU's work and resources on digital inclusion, please visit www.itu.int. Thank you very much for running this uh, short video, which provides you a little bit of the highlights on our work for older person. Um, I also prepare some visual support if the colleague may help me to, to run some of this. And I will try to avoid repetition of uh, some things which were already included in this video or the, the previous speaker have been spoken. So if I can see the, thank you. Well, uh, it is actually well known that this world is digital and wanted or not, we are part of it and we have to adapt to this, uh, to this uh, new environment, uh, digital one. The next slide, please. The first slide. Yes, building a digital inclusive world, it's our dream and access to labor market for all the person, I think, uh, can be facilitated by digital. And I will tell you from my perspective what I think of. Next slide, please. So as I uh, as also uh, mentioned, I do believe that we all have to adapt. This is, this is for sure. Um, uh, all the reports which are related to, <laughs> to the future of work as the last uh, that we, it was issued by the World Economic Forum in April, we all see that almost 80% of the, of the jobs will be transformed and will have in a way a digital component. But I will just say, what in our day to not have a digital component? Uh, this, uh, this seminar actually that it's uh, here, uh, it's actually through digital and enables through digital and everybody can speak comfortable from his workplace or from home and share uh, our work and opinions. From the I2 perspective, I think we all have to, to support policy and decision maker to understand, first of all, to speak all the same language and to understand the difference between access, affordability and accessibility in order to together build this digital inclusive world, regardless of age, gender, ability, location, as already mentioned by uh, Ms. Uh, Malker uh, just before. It's, it's truly important to, to provide all this opportunity without any type of discrimination. And so just roughly, so access, when we talk about access is internet access, is a broadband, is a plug that provide us the internet access. But we also have to ensure then the affordability because we speak about these opportunities that new technology can provide. 
but we also have to ensure that people have the possibility to afford uh, the, the payment of the internet access as well as the, the right equipment, which in fact should be adapted to everyone in need. And here, the most important, the accessibility part. And the accessibility part, it's about how we use the technology, how everybody can use the technology. For instance, an accessible technology is a smart technology, which can be equally uh, used by, uh, in, let's say, a person with visual disability or with hearing impairment or by a young person and also by an older person because we can play with the accessibility feature. So uh, with this in mind, I would say that we all have to ensure that technology is available, affordable and accessible to, to everyone in order to, to ensure that the activities of our life, which in, in this case, we uh, want to, to, to center the discussion uh, for, um, from the perspective of the work, uh, so we have to ensure that this older person have the necessary skills, have the necessary equipment and uh, digital uh, uh, facilities to enable them to continue participating in the social economic life and uh, to uh, perhaps contribute in the workforce that we need so much for the reason that were uh, already explained before. So next slide, please. Well, it was already said uh, why uh, we are uh, actually having this discussion and why it's so critical to, to accelerate decision-making process in ensuring that older people continue to be part of the uh, social economic system uh, and uh, we, we try to be positive, but in fact, indeed, uh, as, as mentioned before, we are facing a crisis. And uh, we clearly see almost everywhere in the world, and I invite you all to, to take a look of your home country and to see how we look like in, in the next three decades. So we definitely see that actually one in four and even more, one in three in some, uh, some uh, uh, parts of the world or more, uh, will be people aged 60 and above. And that calls for, for a concrete action and uh, immediate action on ensuring that everyone is skilled to be able to contribute to the social economic global system. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, colleagues. Thank you. So we were also talking about the silver economy, the labor market, the new avenues of inclusion. Well, um, I think uh, like already discussed, uh, it depends. It depends of the level of education. It depends of the uh, level of, uh, uh, let's say social economic environment. It depends of many things. And the time is very short to, to explore uh, each of these. But what is truly important to, to, to keep in mind is that in any event, uh, older person should be viewed as a contributor to the societies. I'm coming from a culture in, in which we always, always pressure um, our, our grandparents and we always appreciate their wisdom and their knowledge why should be different in, in our days? There are so many CEOs retiring for a, a big companies who retire for a day to, to another. Don't you think that these people can be powerful mentors to the young generation? Don't we really believe that our parents and our grandparents still have things to transfer to us and to help us in advancing this uh, uh, the decision-making process. Um, I the the only the only thing that I want to 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 highlight here is that perhaps it's very important also to change a little bit the the way we we approach the the topic of older person. I truly don't 
believe that all older persons are vulnerable. Of course, that age and age-related disabilities are there, but we still have the chance to age in a digital world. And in a world in which uh, with all this uh, evolution in terms of health and everything, many, many of these uh, can be overcome uh, by technology, by advancement uh, that we, we all recognize. So perhaps the only thing that we, we have to, to ensure is that appropriate policies and strategies are in place to recognize and to make this shift that we all need um, from the, uh, let's say even mindset, if I can say like this, and to, to, to truly implement it. And perhaps in future, even to reflect this in, in, uh, in uh, this convention that we all uh, wait to, to, to happen at the UN level and to, to give a, a, a true power of, uh, of uh, uh, this uh, age group. Next slide, please. So about the, the labor markets. So we discuss about the digitalization and globalization and the fact that it's changing everything. It's changing uh, the, the way we communicate, we uh, have information. Definitely will also change the, the situation in the labor market. So um, for instance, online job application became the norm in our days. They are not anywhere newspapers of where to find this job. So in order to ensure this, we have to, to be very clear that the very first step should be implemented. And this very first step is to incorporate appropriate technology and to ensure that the technology is digitally accessible for everyone. Without this, we risk to create a huge digital gap like never ever before because uh, the, the huge advance of technology, the huge advance of artificial intelligence and so on. So it's the right momentum that all together try to ensure that we have a digital inclusion and accessibility of the technology with regard to the use of technology is a key word to ensure that everyone without any discrimination will benefit from this. The next slide, please. Also trying to, to keep the timing, Ana Lucia, I'm a little bit late. So yes, uh, we just, I just want to, to um, reiterate something that was, uh, was mentioned, the multi-generational workforce, a win-win for all. I think it's a, it's a model that we all have to, to keep in mind. There were examples, there were statistics that show the added value of this and to bring together and develop the individuals from a variety of life stage and information and knowledge can only be positive. So uh, with, with this in mind, I will also um, uh, highlight that teleworking, the fact that we can work from home, it's also a huge enabler and a, a, a huge hope for, for older person to be able to continue in a different way, the involvement in, in the work, um, work market uh, while still contributing to the society, but in a way that is more adapt for, for their uh, age. Finally, the last slide, please. We already told you what we are doing, and I, I only can invite you all to, to take all our resources, first of all, are free of charge in multiple languages and in digital accessible format, so can be also used for my person with uh, visual and hearing disabilities. And um, in addition to, to, to uh, the resources that we have for, for aging, we also have in accessibility. And my, my last call, and please uh, put the, the next slide, is to ensure that everybody, everybody can contribute to mainstreaming aging, to create programs and policies, to promote age diversity, to involve uh, all uh, end users. So in this case, older person in the program that we're doing for, uh, for them. And as just mentioned, to, to find appropriate solutions that are appropriate from the perspective of the contribution, but also from the perspective of uh, the, the, the age circumstances and 
uh, work from home is just uh, one of this. And with this in mind, I thank you very much for, for your attention. And in the last slide, uh, if the colleagues help me to put it, I just uh, put the QR code for, for the resources. We have over 70 resources in ICT accessibility and about 10 resources in, in, uh, for the aging. And I, I truly invite you to use this and to distribute this within your network because only by working together, we can make the change. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, dear Roxana. Um, your explanation has been quite interesting. Uh, Thank you. Indeed, le learning uh, on the challenges and opportunities coming from ICTs uh, represent, um, that ICTs represent in different fields is quite important, including in access to labor markets uh, for older persons. Nowadays, it's a must that we should be aware for inclusion purposes. Now, uh, we are going to learn from the demographic perspective. Let me warmly welcome our colleague, Michael Herman. He has more than 20 years of work experience in the UN, serving in headquarters and field offices. Before assuming his current role as senior advisor on economics and demography, uh, demography with UNFPA, he held various position, uh, positions with UNTA. His uh, work focuses on economics, demography, and sustainable development, and the strengthening of the science policy interface. He is member of the WEF's uh, uh, Global Expert uh, Network, author and co-author of more of a dozen UN flagship reports on the world economy uh, and the poorest countries, and editor and lead author of Consequential Omissions, How Demography Shapes uh, Development, a book on the ways in which unfolding demographic changes are uh, determining progress towards development uh, goals. Impressive. Michael, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, um, Ana Lucia, um, colleagues and guests, a warm welcome from my side. Look, for us, that's UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, it's really a pleasure that we could be part of this first part of the series and that we are part of this series now. Yeah. Um, like other speakers, I too have a PowerPoint presentation to share and let me try to do that now. Just a sec, bear with me. Tell me whether you see it and whether it's on full screen, please. Yeah, we can see it, but it's not in full screen. Okay, let me try to do this again. Perfect. Yeah. Now, yeah, go okay. ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Look, um, let me give you, maybe start out with a bit of a context for this presentation. Now, um, in November last year, the world population reached the 8 billion mark. Yeah. And in the decades to come, the world population will continue to grow. Um, but beyond, you know, underneath this global trend, there's an increasing diversity in demographic terms amongst the countries. The number of countries where we have high population growth is shrinking. The number of countries where we have slow, no, or negative population growth is actually increasing. Yeah. Fertility levels around the world, even in the poorest countries where they still remain relatively high, have fallen. Okay. Today, more than 60%, 66% of the world population actually already live in countries where the total fertility rate, that's the average number of children per woman, is 2.1 or less. Yeah. So if this fall in fertility at the global level is the driver of population aging. 
at the regional or subnational or national level, subnational level, of course, migration is another factor that contributes to rapid population aging. Yeah? So population aging is really the overarching demographic trend of the century. Yeah? And many observers, not just policymakers, academics, have termed population aging a population bomb. Now, I don't like this term at all, because there's very few things that in social sciences we can project with such a degree of confidence for so many years in advance as demography. So we knew decades ago that the world population will be aging. There's nothing sudden about it. It doesn't have to be explosive, especially not if countries anticipate and prepare for it. But let me speak in this presentation a little bit about the anxieties around population aging, policy responses to population aging, and also draw some conclusions. So this is just a map of Eastern Europe, Central Asia to tell you, and we heard that before, it's a region in the world where that's actually leading the world into the next demographic transition, if you like. Most countries with the highest number of older people or the highest share of older people rather, with the highest share in population of population decline are in this region. But other countries around the world will follow suit. Now, what's this fuss? Um, about, about population aging. Much has to do with something that demographers call a dependency ratio. Yeah? Now we have to be aware there's not one dependency ratio, there's many different dependencies ratios and many different ways of measuring dependency. Maybe the most common dependency ratio is to look at everybody under the age of 15, everybody above the age of 65 in relationship to those in between and say everybody under, under that working age, everybody above is dependent. Yeah? And now you can change the working age a little bit instead of saying everybody under the age of 15, you say everybody under the age of 25, everybody above the age of 65. That's the most common dependency ratio. And you know it is increasing uh, as we have seen in Dorothea's presentation, for example. Yeah? There's another way of looking at dependency that's not chronological from the day we are born and counting from there, but it's rather prospective. So we are counting from the probable day or year of our death and down. Yeah? So we could say we don't automatically become dependent when we are 65. We become dependent when we are about 10 years, 15 years away from our probable death. Yeah? That has something to do with life expectancy, which has increased a lot, or healthy life expectancy. If we were to calculate dependency ratios that way, and YASA and the Wittgenstein uh, Center in Vienna are engaged in these efforts and have really pioneered this way of thinking about aging, you will see that dependency ratios are also going to increase, but much less because we also live much longer, we are much healthier, we have healthy life expectancy. Healthy life expectancy is not as long as life expectancy. Of course, there's years where we still live in not in good health. But if we take that into consideration, the potential for longer work lives, dependency ratios don't increase as dramatically. Now, as an economist, I look at all of this and think, well, okay, but is this really what dependency is? And I don't think so, honestly. Yeah. Um, dependency is really who can pay and who can't pay for what they have. Yeah. So another way to look at dependency ratio, and it's actually an SDG indicator, is to look at everybody who's employed and everybody who's not employed. Okay, so everybody who's not employed is kind of dependent because they don't have a labor income. Yeah, and everybody who's employed is presumably not dependent. Although, of course, there are nuances. You know, some people are living in working poverty, as ILO data shows us. So not everybody who has a job automatically is well off and is not, you know, is, is automatically independent. Finally, another way of looking at dependency ratios is, is based on something that we call the national transfer accounts. And I'll say a bit more about this in just a minute. And that look that assumes everybody is dependent who is unable to cover their own consumption from their own income. Yeah. Okay, from the and that's their labor income. Let me look at this now for, for a second in the next slide. So National transfer accounts map national accounts data by age. So they map 
for persons of different ages, of all ages, the labor income, that's the pink line that you see on this panel, and the consumption, which is the gray line that you see on this panel. The vertical axis is a monetary value. The horizontal axis is age. Yeah? And what you see is a shape and of curves that look the same in almost, with, with some differences, of course, but in principle, the same in all countries in the world that have national transfer accounts, which are about 100 countries in the world. Okay, so now if you look at this chart, you will see that, wow, younger people up to the age of 15, they consume, but they don't earn nothing. Okay, now you look to the right, older people from the age of 60 on, wow, their consumption starts exceeding their, their labor income. Yeah, now that's a fact. Okay, this is based on actual data. Yeah, the consumption of young people is mostly related to education expenditures that of all the people related to healthcare expenditures. Now, one might look at this and think, oh my God, you know, uh, now if the number of all the people increases and they're consuming much more and they're not earning so much, you know, what does that mean for public finances? How do we cover that? Yeah, and it that causes some anxieties and I think it's, it's important to think about it, but it's not, um, it would be wrong to panic. Yeah, be why? All countries in the world, whether they have a younger or an older population, have a life cycle deficit. So what you see here is a normal thing. Yeah. Now that will increase with aging. Right? Also increase if you have a lot of younger people. But just looking at this data, you can't say it's a problem or it's not a problem. This is just an account. If you look at national accounts of an economy, you can't derive policy conclusions. You can't say much. With this, it's the same. You have to be aware of what's going to happen to consumption and labor income, but then you have to do secondary analysis of the economic situation of a country, economic growth, poverty levels, inequality, and so on, and the scope of financing the expenditure, consumption expenditures. Yeah, um, But this is at the heart, these anxieties, uh, these, these demographic dependencies ratios are at the heart of many of the anxieties that countries have about aging. Now, other things we have also heard about, it's, and we have, that's related to the chart that you just saw, you have pressures on healthcare systems, you have pressures on the pension systems, you have a challenge to finance social protection to some extent. Many are worried, and it's real in many countries, that uh, there are labor shortages and skills, and skills shortages. I would like to emphasize that the two are not the same. Sometimes they're used interchangeably. Sometimes people mean a skills shortage. Oh, we're lagging doctors. We're lagging engineers. But they say labor shortage. A general labor shortage is something different than a skills shortage. Okay, Both can happen and both are likely to happen within the process of aging, but they require very different policy responses. So we have to be very clear what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, we have also heard about the worries that aging might imply a decline in innovative capacities, competitiveness, productivity. Yeah. However, I would like to emphasize that there are studies on the cognitive ability of older persons and their productivity, and they are not all conclusive. There are some studies that argue that actually older persons have certain cognitive abilities that are stronger even than those of younger persons. So I think it's a mixed mix picture. Yeah. Also, micro-level data from the United States, for example, shows that, yes, older persons create fewer new companies than younger persons, but more of the companies created by older persons survive than those of younger persons. Yeah. So I, I think it would be wrong to draw a hasty conclusion that the aging might negatively impact innovation or productive capacities. Countries are worried for other reasons as well about aging, and they have to do with political and military might, and also actually about with ethnic and cultural shifts. You know, if certain parts of the population have fewer kids than others. And uh, some of these worries are real. Some of them are exaggerated. Some of them, I think, are worryingly misguided. Um, as this might be, you know, UNFPA is working with about 150 countries around the world to address demographic issues. Yeah. And uh, many countries turn to UNFPA more and more and say, look, 
help us address the challenge of population aging. Yeah. And uh, in many cases, they want us to help them stop population aging, if you like, or population decline. Yeah. Now, I mentioned this is mostly due to fertility levels, but it's also due to higher life expectancy, and it's shaped by migration. These are the three determinants of population aging. Yeah. Now, most countries, let's, if you look at these three determinants, there's only one acceptable direction of change as regards mortality and life expectancy. It has to increase. It's, we can't manipulate it. Okay. Migration, countries can counter population aging through migration. Actually, Germany, my own country, has done so successfully for quite a long time, okay, um, through immigration. But it's too sensitive to touch for many countries. So most countries we talk with, they want to boost fertility levels. Yeah. Now, there doesn't have to be anything wrong with pronatalist policies. They can be highly problematic, but they don't have to. But they are many times not effective. Yeah. So focusing on the determinants of aging in that way is, is plausible. And, uh, you know, we're happy to support countries in thinking through this, but it's not the answer. The answer has to be focusing on challenges that unfold because of population aging. And they include the pension age, healthcare systems, labor markets, and many other challenges. Now, one problem that we see when we are looking at the policy responses of countries is that basically countries, A, don't really anticipate population aging. They don't plan for it. They react to it when it causes a, a problem, if you like, in parentheses, yeah? when it threatens to boost, to, to you know, bust the pension system. Okay, there's a problem, chuck the you know, hammer over the head, they fix the pension system. Well, there's a problem to the healthcare system, chuck. They try to fix the pension system. There's a problem to something else. Zack, they fix it. They try to fix it. But this response to population aging is ad hoc. It's based on a, it's a very partial, you know, it's fragmented. And it's based on a negative per perception of population aging. And we always argue, look, it's important to anticipate population aging. We can do it. Yeah, we have the data. It's important to take a comprehensive approach. Don't just hit problems over the head as they appear. Yeah. And we have to take a positive approach. We have to really think, how do we make the most of it? That we all live longer lives, that we are health aging, that we're healthy. You know, as was said in the introduction to this, this webinar, it's a huge present to society. It's a present to us as individual individuals it's a presence to society we really need to think how do we make more of that and that's a little bit missing in uh, in the conversation now in unfpa in response to these mounting requests by countries we have created something that's called the demographic resilience program uh, to work with countries addressing demographic anxieties it's based on evidence and grounded in human rights to make sure that policy responses to demographic anxieties don't contradict human rights or uh, threaten a rollback. And uh, just a brief, uh, let me say, briefly say a few words about the program. Its overarching objective is to help build societies that are resilient to and can thrive amidst demographic change. It requires that governments understand, plan for, and shape demographic changes. It's dependent on a stronger science policy nexus. Uh, governments must consider systematically population data and projections and plan ahead. It's also based on strengthening human capital throughout the life course. And we have heard about this a lot already. Let me just be very clear. Healthy and active aging doesn't start with the age of 60 magically. It starts at earliest childhood with the nutrition of the baby, of the mother. That's when active and healthy aging starts we have to take a life course perspective to active and healthy aging. Another element of this program is help countries build social systems based on population projections, actuarial analysis that are resilient to demographic change, infrastructure, service delivery. And a, a fourth element is to strengthen the discourse around demography, have an open 
and rights-based discourse in society. Let me conclude with a couple of key messages. And I, I do swear Dorothea and I, we did not have a conversation beforehand. So, uh, but you will see that there's quite a few overlaps actually in, in the key messages and her conclusions. The first one is aging is a mega trend. You have to, we have to realize that, but it's happening at the same time as other mega trends. And you can't think it alone. It's difficult enough to think aging alone but it strongly interacts, and Roxana has said that, with digitization, okay, with the new, which has hugely important implications for the new world of work, uh, we have to think these things together. Otherwise, our solutions will be partial, okay? Secondly, we have to design social systems that are fit for the new realities and are cognizant that of life paths that are much less linear than before. Before we had they went to, ed, to school, then we entered the labor market. We basically worked a lot. We saved a lot until we retired, and then we spent it all. Yeah? Now, life paths are not like this anymore. They are much more random. We go back to school somewhere in the middle. We take time out because for leisure to raise a kid, to care for parents, we go back to work. Maybe we start an enterprise. Maybe it goes bust. We do something else. Okay, We need social systems that accompany a new life path which will look differently than the social systems that we have. We have to promote much greater flexibility and inclusion in the labor market. And we heard a lot about this already. But let me also just say very clearly, look, if countries, if, if I go to somebody and say, wow, I have good news for you, you can work 10 years longer. You know, most people will actually probably say, oh God, no, please, yeah? And, and they will go take to the streets or something, yeah? And this, I think, is not because people want to sit on the beach for the rest of their life. It is because they can't imagine doing the same thing they've been doing in the same way they have been doing it for another 10 years, okay? But by just expanding, extending, pushing back retirement age, that's exactly what we're doing, yeah? We are creating a situation where just everybody keeps doing what they're doing for another 10 or whatever years, yeah? That's not going to be the right approach. Yeah? The right approach is to create much more flexible ways of engagement, yeah? Part-time work, flex-time work, I don't know what, changing your career at the age of 60. Go into care work, do something else, okay? We have to create these opportunities if we are serious about it. Just telling everybody I have good news for you, you work another 10 years, won't cut it. Okay, we have to create much more inclusive labor markets for women. Yeah? In many countries, we have heard about this. Female labor force participation is still low. Some countries have managed to increase it a lot. What policies are required to do that? For example, better balancing reproduction and production or reproductive ambition to raise a family and to also make a career is one of the things. It has, has a lot to do with gender equality. That's important here. We can think and we maybe should think about abolishing retirement age altogether. Yeah. You know, some countries in the world, the United States doesn't have a retirement age. Yeah. But I would say that proposing that without at the same time saying we still need to have a social system that enables people to retire if they have to and want to would be cynical. Okay. Because just doing away with retirement age without any social protection. I think would be a step back from where we are. A step forward would be to say, you can work, you can work longer, you can work until you drop. But if you can't work anymore, if you don't want to work anymore, if you're exhausted, if you want to do something else, we also have a social system in place that will allow you to retire in dignity. Yeah. Then I think the fifth one is, we have to adopt a life course perspective on aging. We have heard about this. Uh, it starts at earliest childhood. Aging is a process, it's not a state. Yeah. As we are developing aging strategies, we have to be mindful, this is not all the people's strategies. It has to be an aging strategies. It's about the young, it's about the old, it's everybody in between. Yeah. And we need to pursue much more, as I said also before already, we have to shift away from the approaches we currently have that are reactive. 
negative fragmented to approaches that are forward-looking, positive, and integrated. Yeah. And of course, that requires also, you know, fixing to some extent the policy problem that we have. Yeah, it's a typical policy dilemma, if you like. Addressing the challenges that come because of population aging requires us to take actions now that might not all be very popular. And policymakers that have a time, per time perspective of maybe elected officials of four years are very reluctant to take such decisions because of an issue that arises in 20 years from now. Okay, So we have a policy dilemma, if you like, that if we don't fix it, we will never anticipate demographic changes. We will always be reactive. Yeah. In conclusion, let me just say, aging is better than the alternative. That's true for individuals. It's true for societies. At UNFPA, we're happy to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Michael, for your insights on the impacts of the demographic uh, changes on the labor markets uh, for all the persons did throughout the aging process. Uh, we are running out of time. We beg uh, for your patience. And we still have two wonderful speakers. So now let me warmly welcome uh, Madame Anna Chaviera, Senior Specialist at the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights in Poland. She also represents ENHRI in the GANRI uh, Working Group on Aging and Human Rights of Older Persons in role, uh, with the role of Vice Chair of this working group. She's a sociologist and a senior specialist in the Department of Equal Treatment um, in Warsaw. Uh, where since 2011, she organizes social research on discrimination based on grounds of gender, disability, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and uh, beliefs. Her tasks uh, include also monitoring uh, the state's policy on aging and the works of uh, the UN Open and the Working Group on Aging in New York. Please, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. I will try to be as brief as possible. Uh, I will share my screen if you allow me. Mm, one second, I need to check it. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And here it goes with presentation. I hope you will see the full screen soon when I will start the presentation. Can you see the full screen now? Uh, yes, the slide? Perfect. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I, I, I would like to say a few words on the right to work and access to labor market in older age from the human rights perspective, as it is the as the perspective of the Office of the Commissioner for the Human Rights of Poland, which I represent. It is, as you, uh, Ana Lucia said, a national human rights institution and an equality body at the same time, which is important because we have another tasks combined with this um, title of an equality body. And we monitor um, state of equal treatment also on labor market and also on the ground of age and uh, both in legislative uh, um, legal framework and in practice and as you can see the polish law prohibits discrimination on the ground of age in the sector of employment in line with the relevant eu legislation and actually it is the only sector when age discrimination is prohibited in, uh, explicitly in polish uh, legislation. But as an equality body, we conduct also research on discrimination. And in one of the surveys we conduct frequently uh, since uh, some years, um, we ask about some um, examples. This is a representative survey. We ask people if examples of discrimination, acts of discrimination, uh, they perceive as uh, as discrimination or not. And one of these examples is exactly termination of employment for the sole reason of achieving retirement age. And as you can see, the numbers, 40% of our society do not perceive this uh, act of discrimination as discrimination. They see it as a normal thing to fire someone because uh, he or she um, reach to um, retirement age. But majority of Poles perceive this as discrimination, which is a good news, but still only 28%. So even not one third of our, uh, our population is aware of 
the, that the legislation that we have the legislation which prohibits the kind of discrimination on the labor market. What it gives us, um, this is uh, this is an, a huge awareness gap. This forty percent of people who do not see it as a discrimination. This is one point. The second point is that only one third, and even not one third, of our population have the tool is equipped with knowledge that they can tackle this issue and proceed with some. Um, uh, actions uh, to combat this situation. Um, and this is not only Polish example, because um, as I as I said, 40% of uh, our society sees it as a norm. And as we could listen today to uh, Dr. Claudia Mahler, independent expert, she also noticed it in one of her reports, the report on ageism and age discrimination, and I quote, that the pervasiveness and omnipresence of ageism globally is such that discrimination marginalization and exclusion of older persons are anticipated as the norm. So it is not only Poland, it is a broader issue. And this broader issue, as, as I think we should be aware also of, is tackled on global level at the UN level at, in the, during the session, sessions of open-ended working group on aging, among uh, other areas, also right to work and access to labor market has been tackled. But what we've learned from this uh, sessions that the right is interconnected with other rights, with right to health, right to education. We cannot tackle this right separately from other rights. They are interconnected. Here are the links to the uh, submissions to the compilations documents um, submitted to this debate debates in 2021 and 2022. I will skip it now, and but I encourage all of you to 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 look inside and to to learn more what has been said so far about this topic uh, at this global level at UN level. Um, here are also some outcomes and conclusions. But I would like actually go straight to institutional ageism as as a national human rights institution, and there is a I think almost in every country is a national human rights institution, um, and uh, I encourage you to, if you are not working at some, to reach out to one of those and ask for support and ask for cooperation in this regard, because I believe that national human rights institutions, as, as we deal with uh, legis legislations, laws, and policies on an everyday basis, this is exact partner to tackle institutional ageism. And what it is, it is uh, um, after a global report on ageism published by WHO, it refers to the laws, rules, social norms, policies, and practices of institutions that unfairly restrict opportunities and systematically disadvantage individuals because of their age. And what we have now in plans, um, we, we would like to commission uh, analysis, more in-depth analysis of Polish legislation and public policies exactly to, to tackle, to, to, to challenge it um, against institutional ageism. And one example I just would like to share with you, that the definition of an unemployed person in Polish law indicates that it is a person in working age. In Poland, it is 60 for women and 65 for men. And it seems that the social protection in retirement age reduces the right to work in older age, as the measures foreseen for people uh, in working age are not any more available for older persons as they do not fit into, the, into this definition. Of course, there might be some other policies, so therefore we need a more broader analysis on that to, to challenge it. But also I would challenge the assumption that Mm, it's hidden in definitions and in terms also used in statistics of working age and retirement age that people of retirement age are not anymore able to work. And that's this assumption impacts, affects the policies and laws, making it more ageist than it should be. Um, and therefore, it's I'm really grateful for, for the previous presentation and tackling this um, dependency ratio, how different it could be tackled, because I think these anxieties are also hidden here, but this assumption is also impacting the policies. That's my hypothesis, and I wish, I hope we will manage to, um, to check it more in depth 
afterwards. Few words of possible actions for NHRIs. So again, I really would be delighted if you could reach out to your NH national human rights institution in your country um, in order to strengthen the right to work in older age. So first, uh, recalling the first slides, raise awareness on age discrimination on labor market and what is prohibited by laws already and what should be prohibited by law. Analyze institutional ageism and expose it. And third, last but not least, advocate for a new UN Convention on the Rights of Older Persons at national, regional, and global level, as this would give us the standards, international standards, which should be implemented uh, um, and, and which would assure the right to work in older age. I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dirana, for, for your important presentation. I truly hope we have more time in a uh, near future opportunity. Now, uh, I give the floor, please, to Professor Michael Stein. Uh, he's the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability, visiting professor at Harvard Law School since 2005. We have the pleasure to welcome you uh, back in this uh, second event of the series. He uh, is going to share with us some uh, insights about uh, the legal gaps, um, the existing legal gaps at the international level regarding access to labor markets. Please, Dr. Stein, the floor is yours. Thank you ever so much. And thank you to the prior panelists who provided very rich, interesting, and, and very useful um, data points and, and arguments. And it's an honor to be with you. It's also an honor for us at the Harvard Law School Project on Disability to be supporting this work, uh, and also in some way to work with Ambassador Gallegos and moving forward uh, with the treaty on, on older persons' rights. Um, I'll comment on, on what the prior panelists said and hopefully offer some, some thoughts. Um, one is that Dr. schmidt Clow and, and uh, and Dr. Mahler and Commissioner Chaviera all refer to ageism, and I agree with that completely. Um, but I would also note that, at least from my world, disability rights, um, this all fits within the idea of ableism, the idea that the normal, quote unquote, individual who should be filling a spot in the labor market is an able bodied white male. Um, preferably heterosexual, et cetera, and that individuals who deviate from this established norm um, create special problems, raise extra costs, um, are not easy to simply slot in and slot out, and don't fit the basic model of, of the labor market. Um, this is all, you know, labor markets are a good and valuable heuristic. By and large, they, they function. Um, but there are many market inefficiencies within our standard Western idea of labor markets. Um, and they also are based upon baselines that are not empirically proven. Um, Mr. Herman raised a lot of good points about the value of age and efficiencies. Um, we, no longer, we no longer try to assess efficiency by the idea of producing 40 widgets in an hour. Um, it's based upon other, other ideas and larger benefits to the larger group of employees, as, as Dr. Mahler mentioned, um, and why we should not include those as part of efficiency, why dignity, why a happy workplace, if that doesn't sound too naive, um, should not be of, of value, um, is one that, that I wrestle with and that I engage uh, governments and others on. So basically, we have populations of marginalized people who are considered as extra um, or excess. Um, and if I'm being too pointed here, um, kindly reflect on who it was who was excluded from the labor market after 2008, who it was uh, that, that were excluded from COVID relief uh, most recently in the pandemic. It's those marginalized populations, again, that we as a global society have stigma against and do not include. And I think we need to remember the value and the dignity of individuals and what that means to our societies going forward when we calibrate benefits and costs 
and where we want the, the future to go. Um, speaking strictly, you know, um, uh, personally, uh, I find there is a tension between economics and efficiency and between human rights and dignity. They're not mutually exclusive, and I, I try to use both, but they are two different languages with two different goals. And each of them has certain values that are embedded in them that perhaps don't always come across if you're going to simply use one packet of ideas rather, rather than the others. Um, from the economic position, you know, there's several solutions to, to the idea of older persons um, and, and their under or unemployment. Right? One is the delayed retirement that the OECD and other entities have been pressing for. Um, the other is mass immigration, which is not going to happen for reasons of politics, culture, et cetera. And by calling it culture, I'm being polite. Um, increased taxation upon those who remain in the workforce. Right? The numbers are, you know, as we get closer to the one-to-one -one ratio, which Japan has exceeded, right, or the two-to-two -two ratio of people in the workforce of people receiving social benefits, which include pensions, one of the solutions is to increase those taxes, and the other is simply to deprive people of social protection, which seems to be an answer in, in various countries. Um, it is not an acceptable answer to a, to a human rights lawyer um, or someone who cares about dignity. So an overall question as we move forward, and one thing that we did not discuss uh, is the impact of, of AI. Um, we had some very good discussions uh, by Ms. Widmer Lesko on the benefits of ICT, and, and I agree with that. Um, I would mention, as I did during the last session, that it's not simply, in quotation marks, simply about access for older persons in the way that it's access for persons with disabilities. Yes, there is overlap as far as, as font size, as far as manipulating text, as far as seeing, hearing, and accessing what's on the internet and elsewhere. Um, but there's also the idea of cognitive load. In some ways, the aging population is, is going to mirror or have some of the same needs as say people with intellectual disabilities only being able to receive and, and contain a certain amount of data uh, at a time and in conditions such as dementia and, and others, um, that cognitive load is severely reduced. So I think we need to think about ICT that way. Um, there's also, uh, as much as I agree um, with the idea that telework is, is can and should be a viable alternative, and again, for my world of disability, employers for years and years and years said you had to be in person. Otherwise, the workplace was not the same and the world would end and we would all, you know, crash and burn and our businesses would go out of business. Well, the pandemic came and lo and behold, the world didn't end. It, it will end with climate change fairly soon, but it didn't end because of telework. Um, and now that we're in theory, post-pandemic, which I don't believe, but in theory, post uh, the, the hump of, of the pandemic, what we're seeing, at least here from the US, is that employers are reverting to their reluctance and their resistance to telework. Despite big areas like New York's downtown and San Francisco having hundreds of thousands of, of cubic meters of office space empty, these employers are refusing to go to telework and instead insisting that workers show up and interact because it's part of the sociology, in their words, um, of work. So when we think about ICT as well, we ought to be thinking about, you know, what are the values that underlie employers? What are the values that underlie labor markets? What are the values, as Mr. Herman pointed out, of creating social policies? And what is it that we want to support? And what is it that we may want to turn away from or change? Um, with AI, if anything, you know, the numbers range between 800 million and 1 billion jobs lost anywhere from 2030 to 2035, depending on who you believe. Where will persons who are older and who are alleged um, not to be as adept uh, at ICT, where will they fit in this? Where will they, where will they fit in this? Overall, because I, I want to leave us time to, to wrap up, um, I guess my question is that of social planning uh, and, and inclusion. Um, and again, here is, is, a, is a large problem because 
politicians have budgets and short mandates of power, um, and they're not thinking long-term solutions, which is another reason why we have not addressed climate change. They're thinking about the price of gas now. They're thinking about the cost of social protection now. They're thinking about who will reelect them now. So if we are going to use this as a pivot point, how can we create societies where those who have contributed in various ways can feel that they are valued as older persons, that they can again contribute their experience and their learned knowledges. Um, one thing we don't talk about in efficiency for older workers is their institutional memories and how they understand how places of business, whether their own particular ones or similar ones, actually operate. There's an efficiency value of that, that if we're doing a real cost-benefit analysis, it's not tough variable to figure out, but if we're doing a real cost-benefit analysis, we need to include that in the calculus. Where is the efficiency for knowledges and knowing how the workplace works? Um, where is the efficiency for mentoring individuals? Where are the costs hidden as far as we know about training, we know about hiring and retention, um, where are the costs hidden when the newer, younger, cheaper worker um, has to figure out how the workplace works over a period of months or years? These things need to be considered as well. And most importantly, what kind of society do we want as we increasingly become digital and increasingly become isolated from each other in terms of human-to-human -human interaction? What are the humanities implications? So I'll, I'll leave that since we only have a few minutes. Um, with great thanks to my preceding panelists and, and to the organizers. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Stein. Uh, always a pleasure to hear how your mind um, uh, approaches things in a very holistic manner. And uh, in a way, I'm very happy also to hear you actually did an excellent wrap up. And that's good news because uh, Ana Lucia and I we're thinking, how are we going to do the wrap up without going beyond the two hours that, that the webinar should have? And we have only four minutes left. So uh, as always, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those uh, insights and uh, for that um, understanding of this in a holistic manner. Now, just two things, uh, and, th and then we go. Uh, to you participants, uh, my respect to you. It's in an hour and uh, 55 minutes and you're still here. <laughs> Some of you had to go, but uh, still almost 90 people. Uh, we, we had at the beginning, I think 120, 130. It's a sizable audience and we take it responsible. So to make the most of the time, I'm going to ask uh, just one of, of the panelists or perhaps even Madame Mahler, because it's uh, quite an, an honor to have you here. You are the foremost expert uh, in this uh, topic from the point of view of the United Nations system uh, and in, in your current role. Um, this is the question because we have received several from the floor, several questions, and it's a pity that there is not enough time, as I say, but uh, the issue of adopting a multilateral instrument, a treaty, a convention or, or the like, as uh, I always use this example because it's excellent, as we did with the CRPD, the Convention of the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities that most of us knows, and I think the audience that is listening also will remember, uh, it's a long way it has to include everyone and uh, the stakeholders have to be involved in consultation or have to have ownership of, of, of the processes, not only for the UN or, uh, member states and governments, but using that example, if I can postulate to any, any of you and definitely to you, Madame Mahler, you are not off the hook yet. <laughs> can you give us some comments on how should we go about that? I believe summarizes several of the questions. What should happen so this planet of ours actually have that type of instrument in a couple of years. Who would like to take the floor or, or you, uh, Claudia? Thank you so much, Alex, for this question. Uh, I will try to do it in a, a couple of seconds. So what we need now is drafting and including everybody and also let them participate. I think it's time now we discussed this for more than a decade in the UN Open Ended Working Group on Aging. We have tons of material where we show quite clearly that there are gaps which can be closed. And we also show that a convention or an international human rights binding instrument would have additional added value to all of us because it gives guidance 
to all of us. It gives guidance to government. It includes also the people who are aging and it might also tackle all the intersectional factors which we mentioned today. And as everybody mentioned, we don't only have one huge um, challenge right now. We have a couple of them. And I think it's time now to also rearrange our human rights framework and take them into account to make it as active and as possible for everybody to get perfect guidance for this. And I think also Professor Stein showed us quite clearly how CRPD, the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability, gave us this kind of framework to focus on personhood, diversity, and also dignity in the workforce and in all the different measures. I stop here. I thank you to include me for this conference today. And I'm sorry. And I'm very sorry that I was late. Thank you so much. Not a problem. You, you have benefited us all. We thank you. Now, uh, just uh, out of respect for you, dear colleagues, uh, and, and indeed you are foremost experts. Any final comment from any of you? Okay. <laughs> so being exactly uh, one hour and 50, uh, 59 minutes, uh, shy of two hours, um, uh, let me thank all of you, dear participants, for attending this Access to Labor Markets for All the Persons webinar, and uh, to our distinguished speakers, our sincere appreciation on behalf of UNITAR and uh, all the co-organizers. Last thing, always the commercial. Remember, this is just the second event on the second annual edition of the virtual roundtable series on mainstreaming knowledge on aging. Uh, we invite you to come to the next one. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. This webinar is adjourned. Have a good day.